Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending this webinar hosted by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Today's webinar will be focusing on the proposed neonicotinoid mitigation measures for agricultural crops and getting your feedback. These mitigation measures stem from the neonicotinoid reevaluation DPR is conducting. But before we dive into the proposed mitigation, let's quickly go over some logistics. Spanish interpretation for today's webinar is being provided. All attendees watching on Zoom will need to click on the interpretation icon and choose a language of their choice, either English or Spanish. Once you choose the language, you may wish to mute the original audio. This does not apply if you're viewing through the webcast link as you will have needed to choose your preferred language already. We can only project one set of slides, however, so if you are listening to the Spanish interpretation, you'll, you will want to get a copy of the Spanish set of slides on, your, on our webpage. In addition to the interpretation icon, there are several other icons on the screen. If you are having te technical issues, we ask that you message us using the chat box. Please do not use the chat box for asking questions. At several points throughout our presentation today, we'll be stopping to answer questions. There are three different ways to ask questions. The first is to type your question using the Q&A box within Zoom. Once again, please do not use the chat function in Zoom to ask questions. The second is when we ask if someone has verbal comments, you can use the raised hand button within Zoom. We will take the questions in order of who raised their hand first and we'll provide the attendee the ability to speak. And lastly, we'll also be taking questions via the neonix at cdpr.ca.gov email address. Anyone watching through the Cal EPA broadcast rather than Zoom, please submit your questions through the neonix email address. If an emailed question or comment is not addressed during the webinar, a staff member will follow up with you afterwards to address your question. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded today. Throughout this presentation, we will be referring to the supporting materials that were posted to our webpage a couple of weeks ago. If you have an electronic copy of this presentation and do not have the other reference materials, click on the link embedded on this slide. Otherwise, you can enter the address or go to our webpage at www.cdpr.ca.gov. And once you're there, click on the A to Z index, scroll down, and click on the reevaluation hyperlink. Under active reevaluations, click on the neonicotinoids hyperlink where you will find links to the reference materials. You'll also notice that the slide presentation and today's agenda are available in Spanish. As noted previously, we plan to address questions during dedicated question and answer sections throughout our presentation. However, if you have any additional comments or questions after this live webinar, please submit them by email to neonix at cdpr.ca.gov. Comments will be accepted until the end of the day on October 11th, 2020. The original commenting period was set to close on September 11th, but we have since granted a request to extend the comment period by 30 days to allow more time to review and comment on the draft regulations. This will be discussed further at a later point in the presentation. Now let me introduce the webinar team. Representing the Department of Pesticide Regulations Reevaluation Unit we have here today Brittany Clendenin, Denise Alder, and myself, Russell Darling. The reevaluation program continuously evaluates pesticides and performs investigations into any pesticides that may cause adverse effects to human health or the environment. Also with us today is our assistant director, Dr. Karen Morrison, and DPR's director, Val Dolcini. Before we get started, we want to express our appreciation for the County Agricultural Commissioners and staff as they are our partners serving as the primary enforcement agents for state pesticide laws and regulations. 
We particularly thank those who have provided and will provide further input on the understandability and enforceability of the proposed regulations from a field perspective. At this time, I wanna hand it over to our director, Val, who would like to say a few words before we get started. Russell, thank you very much and greetings to everyone this afternoon for this second uh, Neonix webinar. This is obviously an ongoing issue for the Department of Pesticide Regulation. We've been at this since 2009. So for the last 11 years, we've been working hard on these proposals and we really appreciate the input that we've received thus far. Throughout this process, we've engaged with other state agencies like our partners at CDFA, with registrants, with the Ag Commissioners, and with many other stakeholders to develop appropriate data requirements and further refine these proposals. This week's workshops build on the 2018 risk determination document. And finally, I would just say we really want your feedback and welcome your input. This is a continuing conversation. We've had a number of uh, side meetings over the course of the summer with commodity organizations and others and look forward to continuing those conversations as well and collaboratively engaging with all of you so that we come up with mitigation proposals that make sense for all Californians. Russell, thank you. Thank you, Val, for sharing your words. The purpose of today's webinar is to present DPR's proposed mitigation measures for the use of neonicotinoids in agriculture. We will also present background information and existing bee protections that are currently in place. I would also like to reiterate what Val touched on. I want to also emphasize that the purpose of this workshop is to hear from you. We anticipate a diverse group of individuals on the webinar today, and we want to make sure that we have a chance to hear everyone's perspectives on our proposed mitigation measures so that we can incorporate that feedback into our decision-making process. Please note that the information presented today is not final and is subject to change based on the feedback that we receive during these webinars. Before we get into the details of the mitigation, I wanna hand the presentation over to Denise Alder to cover background on bee concerns, existing bee protections that are currently in place, and information on neonicotinoids. Thank you, Russell. Over the last several years, there have been many discussions around honeybee colony declines worldwide and the factors that could be playing a role in this effect. Scientists at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency looked into this issue and found that the factors contributing to the decline of bees are a complex set of stressors and pathogens. Bee colonies can be affected in multiple ways, but the most common factors include predatory insects, such as the varroa mite, which transmit deadly viruses to the honeybee, bacterial diseases, such as American fowl brood, malnutrition from a lack of diversity of food sources available, habitat loss due to changing land use patterns and farming practices, and direct pesticide exposure, such as the bee or colony being sprayed or drifted upon, as well as indirect pesticide exposure, where pesticides are found near in nectar and pollen that is then brought back to the colony. All of these factors can cause compounding effects and complex interactions. DPR has the regulatory authority over pesticides and as such, our efforts are strictly looking into the interactions between pesticides and pollinators, which brings me to my next slide on pesticide factors. In the news, you may have heard about several different pesticides that may be affecting bees. These include fungicides, insecticides, and tank mixtures, or a combination of pesticides. DPR received an adverse effect report identifying possible risk to honeybees from exposure to imidacloprid triggering DPR's reevaluation of the nitroguanidine substituted neonicotinoids. This chemical class includes the active ingredients imidacloprid, clothianidin, thiamethoxam, and dinatefuran. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to refer to this neonicotinoid class of pesticides as neonics for short. Neonics act as systemic pesticides. 
systemic pesticides have the ability to be translocated throughout the plant once absorbed by the roots or foliage of the plant. These pesticides can be applied as a foliar or soil application and are especially effective on sucking insects such as aphids. Neonics are registered for a use on a wide variety of crops such as citrus, stone fruits, oil seed, and cereal grains. Imidacloprid was first registered in California in 1994, and a decade later, the other three active ingredients were also registered. Other regulatory agencies are addressing neonicotinoid mitigation measures to protect pollinators in a variety of ways. In January of this year, US EPA announced the availability of their proposed mitigation plan for neonicotinoids. Some of their proposals include mitigation measures for safety to pesticide applicators and homeowners, limiting applications to ornamentals and turf, proposing similar label language that enhance DPR's proposed mitigation. US EPA's comment period for these proposed interim decisions closed in June of this year. Next, US EPA will assess the comments and finalize their mitigation plan. Based on the final plan, pesticide companies will be required to make changes to their pesticide product labels. In addition to California, other states have enacted or are in the process of enacting regulations to further mitigate neonicotinoid use. These efforts include prohibiting applications, adopting stewardship and best management practices, and limiting use by the general public. As you can see, different approaches to address neonicotinoid exposures are in various stages of implementation across the United States. Next, I will cover what DPR has been doing to address neonicotinoid exposure to bees. As DPR progresses through the rulemaking process for neonics, I want to remind you that DPR has already instituted several bee protections. The California Managed Pollinator Protection Plan document, also known as the MP3s, is a central location to find all of California's initiatives to protect pollinators, such as current laws and regulations, citrus bee protection areas, bee protection practice agreements, bee registration and notifications of applications, which can be done through an application called Beware. And lastly, many pesticide labels already have environmental hazard statements designed to protect pollinators that must be followed. These are existing pollinator protection DPR currently has in place. Now I'd like to transition into how DPR is addressing neonicotinoids. As mentioned, the re-evaluation was initiated due to possible adverse effects to honeybees. As part of the re-evaluation, DPR required companies to conduct comprehensive studies by collecting pollen and nectar residue data in certain crops and honeybee toxicity data to assess exposure and risk to bees. Residue data included different rates and timing of applications. DPR scientists evaluated these studies as well as public literature and used the analysis to determine risk. DPR scientists assessed data from residue trials of the four neonics at various rates and timings and compared them to colony feeding studies. This data from the colony feeding studies was used to determine neonic residue levels that pose no significant toxicity to bees. I do want to note that the residue studies assessed in this document were conducted over a two year period at worst case scenarios listed on California labels, which is the highest application rate and the minimum reapplication interval. Throughout the review of the data, DPR scientists identified risks to bees for several crops when using neonicotinoids. 
DPR published the results of this analysis in July 2018 as the California Neonicotinoid Risk Determination. After publishing the risk determination document, DPR received additional information that was then incorporated into an addendum to the risk determination. This addendum was published in January 2019. For more information regarding the scientific methods used to determine risk, please refer to these published documents on DPR's website identified here on the slide. The risks and other information DPR identified and published in these documents were used as a platform to inform our risk mitigation efforts. The risk determination was based on identifying risks as if each of the active ingredients were used at worst case scenarios. However, DPR also had a number of non-worst case scenario residue data on file. In the time since the addendum was published, DPR has reviewed these studies also to identify whether lower application rates could serve as a mitigation option. I will now hand the presentation over to Brittany to discuss our mitigation efforts based on this determination. Thank you, Denise. Following the publication of the risk determination documents, DPR has been working to develop a strategy, strategy to mitigate risk to bees from neonics. One of the questions that DPR was faced with besides what the mitigation will be is how we will be implementing the mitigation. Although requiring pesticide label changes might seem the most straightforward way to implement mitigation, it is important to note that DPR is preempted by federal law from requiring changes to pesticide product labels. Therefore, DPR is proposing to implement the needed mitigation measures by adopting regulations. As DPR worked to draft the proposed regulations, we took many different factors into consideration during the decision-making process. The factors considered, considered in the decision are pesticide residue and honeybee toxicity study findings, current pest management practices, including critical pest issues, such as the need to control invasive pests like Asian citrus psyllid, resistance management and the availability of multiple pesticides for growers to rotate, and the level of pollinator exposure, including use of managed pollinators and the attractiveness of each crop to bees. DPR is trying to balance the complex issue of keeping a critical crop protection tool available while also protecting bees. As such, DPR is applying a multi-level approach based on the crops, crops' attractiveness to bees. Next, we will walk you through what this will look like. This is an overview of the multi-level approach and what it looks like. I will first summarize it and then go into more detail in the following slides. DPR is proposing three levels of restriction based on each agricultural crop's relative attractiveness to bees. On this slide, I will walk you through this from bottom to top. At the bottom level are crops that are not attractive to bees or are harvested before bloom. DPR determined that labeled use on these crops do not present risk to bees and therefore no additional mitigation measures are needed. At the middle level are crops that are moderately attractive to bees. For these crops, DPR is proposing general application restrictions, including prohibiting applications during bloom, limiting the use to one active ingredient per season per year, and only one application method. That, uh, that is either foliar or soil applications. In addition, DPR is proposing additional crop specific restrictions for when managed pollinators will be used with the crop. And at the top level, we have crops that are highly attractive to bees. For these crops, DPR is proposing the general application restrictions that I just described and additional crop specific restrictions. 
I do want to note that to determine each crop's attractiveness to bees, DP, DPR relied on United States Department of Agriculture's document titled Attractiveness of Agricultural Crops to Pollinating Bees for the Collection of Nectar and or Pollen. Before we go into the specifics of the proposed regulations, I will walk you through the structure. The draft regulations are separated into 18 sections. The first part consists of the scope and definitions identified as section YYYY. The YYYY represents the California Code of Re Regulations section number, which will be determined later when we have a final proposal. This is followed by a section describing the proposed general application restrictions. The general restrictions will apply to both crops that are highly attractive and those that are moderately attractive to bees. After the general application restriction section, the remaining regulation sections propose crop specific application restrictions by crop group. DPR is looking for your feedback. And as we walk through the proposed regulations, please keep these topics in mind. The extent of the mitigation or how feasible it is. The organization and clarity of the draft regulations. Is it understandable? The appropriateness of the proposed application rate and timings. Concerns about efficacy against pest for each of the application rates and timings the impacts these regulations would have on critical uses. And lastly, any alternative approaches we should consider. DPR is particularly interested in your feedback on these topics, but welcome any feedback that you may have. We will be stopping at various points throughout the presentation for questions and comments, but at any time you can always uh, email any of your points to neonix at cdpr.ca.gov. Before we move on to discussing the regulations, please refer to the draft regulations posted on our webpage. The next three slides will cover the scope and definition section. In the top right hand corner of the slide is a reference to the page of the draft regulations where you will find the section we're discussing. The regulations provi provides proposed definitions for four terms. For purposes of the proposed regulation, DPR proposes to define bloom to mean from bud break until complete petal fall, crop group, federal regulations, Sorry, I'm, I'm pausing for a second because it said my internet is unstable. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Growing season to mean the time period from planting until harvest is completed for a particular annual crop or biennial crop and is not more than one year or 365 days for perennial crops with multiple annual harvests. Manage pollinators to mean any bees that are used by growers to provide pollination services. These regulations apply to both foliar and soil applications for the production of typical row, orchard, and vine crops. Subsection B is intended to clarify this scope. Subsection B states, the provisions of this article apply to foliar and soil applications of pesticides containing one or more of the active ingredients, clothianidin, dinotafuron, imidacloprid, and thymethoxin, when used for the production of the following agricultural commodities. Berries and small fruits, bulb vegetables, cereal grains, all the way down to 16, which are our miscellaneous crops. 
coffee, peanuts, glow bar chokes, mint, hops, and tobacco. If a crop doesn't fall into one of these groupings, the regulations would not apply. Continuing on with the Continuing on with the scope and definitions, subsection C allows the application of neonicotinoids in the case of an emergency declared by USDA or the California Department of Food and Agriculture, CDFA. This is, this is most likely to apply to invasive species or quarantine actions. For example, if emergency pest conditions such as outbreaks of glassy winged sharpshooters or Asian citrusilid. As previously mentioned, the proposed mitigation for some crops varies based on whether managed pollinators will be used. Subsection D specifies that if managed pollinators are used on site, the property owner is presumed to have known in advance that managed pollinators would be used during the growing season and therefore must use the appropriate mitigation. Now I'm going to cover the general application restrictions. DPR is proposing that the general application restrictions apply to all four neonicotinoids when used on any of the crops identified as highly attractive or moderately attractive to bees. That is those crops that pose risk of exposure to bees. We will cover more specific regulations for each crop group later in the presentation. Subsection A prohibits application during bloom. Subsection B allows use of only one of the four active ingredients to a crop within the same growing season. Subsection C allows only one application type, either soil or foliar to be applied to a crop per growing season except as specified for the palm fruits and stone fruit crop groups. Now we will stop and ask for questions and comments regarding the scope and definitions and the general application restrictions that I just covered. If you have a written question and are watching in Zoom, please use the Q&A box, not the chat function. If you have a question not related to this section of the PowerPoint, please hold your question for one of the other commenting periods. When asking a question or providing a comment, please state your name and any organization you're with. We have 15 minutes for questions and comments here. Due to the limited amount of time, we will be limiting oral questions or comments to two minutes. If you have question, if you, if your question is running long, we will give you 30 second warning and mute your line at two minutes. So please be concise. At the end of 15 minutes, we will wrap up with the question that we are on. We will ask that you hold, any remaining questions regarding this part of the PowerPoint until the end of the presentation, when we will have additional time for questions. Alternatively, you may also submit your question or comment by email. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started with the question and answers posed in our Q&A box, starting with John Boterfolf, who asks, of the factors listed for colony loss, which one has had the most impact on colony loss? It's definitely a complicated factor of combination with the nutrition, pesticide exposure, and the insect pressures that were shown on an earlier slide. The varroa mite does seem to have quite a bit of impact on the colony loss. Thank you, Denise. Next, John also asks via the Q&A box, why is DPR not addressing the human health concerns of neonics? As you know, in January 2020, the European Union did not renew approval for thymocloprid. This was done for more than just protecting pollinators. 
The EU Health Commissioner Stella Perisidids said, quote, there are environmental concerns relating to the use of this pesticide, particularly its impact on groundwater, but also related to human health and reproductive toxicity, end quote. The commission based its assessment on findings of the European Food and Safety Agency published January 2019, which highlighted concerns about thymocloprid toxicity to humans and present in too great a concentration in groundwater. Thank you, John, for your question and comment. As far as the question, this proposed mitigation that we're walking through today is directly stemming from our neonicotinoid reevaluation. That neonic reevaluation was triggered by adverse effects to pollinators. And so that is the scope of this reevaluation. We went out with a data call just for pollinator related data and not human health data. So that is why human health is not addressed in this mitigation. But I do want to note that US EPA did look at those impacts and they published results related to that in their proposed interim decision earlier this year. So uh, I want to point you to their recent work on that. And I did want to provide information to John about Phycloprid, and those products are not currently registered in California. Thank you, Brittany and Denise. It does not look like we have any verbal questions at this time, but John has again used the Q&A box to post how can we get it addressed by DPR. I'm assuming he's asking just a follow-up question. So I'll address that and thanks for the question, John. Um, there's a number of different efforts within the department that are looking at the impacts of neonics. Um, we are currently working on a comprehensive human health risk assessment for metacloprid. And so that would um, be the scientific basis for any action addressing human health impacts from, from neonics, um, but we need to complete that scientific analysis before we can look at taking regulatory action based on that information. I will also mention that US EPA as a part of their work is considering human health impacts for some of the mitigation that they are proposing. So there is action that's being taken on it, but as Brittany mentioned, this particular action is limited to pollinators. Thank you, Karen. Moving on, it does look like at this point, we do not have any raised hands or verbal questions pending and our Q&A box is cleared. Shelly, can you confirm if there are any questions posed by email at this time? Excuse me, thank you, Brad. We have a question from Justin, uh, Justin Goldman, uh, PCA. He asks, did you did you consider the economic damage to each crop given the reduction of active ingredients ingredient allowed to be applied, specifically amid culprit on citrus via soil application? I can take that question, Justin. Oh. Um, so we did partner with the California Food uh, and Agriculture Department of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, to conduct a economic analysis. And so an economic analysis was created um, based on these proposed regulations. And we do plan on releasing it, that economic analysis in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you, Russell. We have no further emailed questions at the moment. All right, moving back to the Q&A. John has again commented, and we have a comment from John that says, bee populations have been declining steadily for more than a decade. What will be the cost to farmers after we have killed most of the bees and pollinators? How much money will it cost to pollinate by hand? Importing bees is not sustainable. This is a national problem, not a local one. Thank you for your comment. Okay. 
Moving on, we do have another Q and answer post by Sarah Hole. Sarah Hole Exorcist says, how is DPR planning to address risks that neonics pose to pollinators besides managed bees, especially native bees, which are essential pollinators for many crops? Yeah, so I can take that question. And um, see, outside of managed pollinators, um, the highly attractive crops would receive mitigation regardless of whether they're pollinators or um, whether they're managed pollinators or not. So that's kind of what the multi-tiered approach is about. If a crop is highly attractive, they are more likely to have bees and therefore the mitigation is applied the entire time. Whereas if a crop is moderately attractive, they're only, the mitigation, the specific crop mitigation is only applied if managed pollinators are present. And outside of that, we have our general application restrictions and those are, are also going to help in reducing the overall amount of pesticides being applied and that will help other pollinators managed or not. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. And again, we have cleared out all of our Q and A's posed in the boxes. Oh, there we go. We have one more. Moving back to Q and A, we have a question posed Sorry, maybe a comment, we'll see. Theodore Schwartzbog writes, as a PCA in the coastal region of Southern California, I believe the subsection B provision prohibiting the application of more than one of the listed active ingredients per growing season is excessive. There are many instances when growers will use an imidacloprid application through the drip tape, then follow up later with a thymethoxin for instance, once the imidacloprid has run out and the aphid pressure has returned. By limiting growers and PCAs to only one active ingredient per season, the only other alternatives in order to control, for example, aphid populations would be more sprays of other pesticides that may not be as selective against the target pest or are not systemic. Yeah, thank you, Theodore, for your comments. Uh, we understand your concern on this area. At this time, we do have that proposed because we don't have substantial substantive data on if multiple active ingredients are applied throughout the year. So a lot of the data that we received and looked at in this reevaluation was direct one active ingredient. So looking at one active ingredient and the residues that those pose. So we don't have at this time a lot of information as to whether multiple uses and mixtures of different active ingredients will or will not, and how they will or will not um, affect bees or pollinators. So that is the reason why we currently have that additional mitigation in place, but we do understand your concerns and comments on that and we um, will be having continued conversations surrounding that. Thank you, Brittany. At this moment, I don't see any Q and A's or raised hands. Shelly, can we really quickly confirm we don't have anything pending by email at this moment? Correct, no new emails, thank you. Okay, seeing as we do not have any pending questions, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section, if that's all right with everyone. Thank you, Brittany. At this point, we are gonna dive into the proposed regulations for each crop group which is divided into the three different levels that Brittany went over. Throughout each slide, I wanna let you know that when we refer to a use rate, that use rate will always be expressed as pounds of active ingredient or chemical per acre per season. 
Additionally, the crop specific use rates and application restrictions listed in the proposed mitigation are derived from data reviewed by DPR's ecotoxicology staff. Our discussion of the regulations here are by the three levels. However, in the text of the proposed regulations, the crop groups are alphabetical. So just a reminder that the slides include a reference page number where you can find the corresponding section in the regulation document. It is important to note that both the general application restrictions that Brittany went over and the crop specific restrictions that I will cover apply to use on crops highly attractive to bees, except in limited cases we will identify. So first up is citrus fruit crop group, which includes crops such as oranges and lemons. The proposed crop specific restrictions would limit soil applications to a specific rate between petal fall and a specific date, either January 31st or December 15th. For example, for thymethoxam soil applications, the maximum rate will be 0.172 pounds active ingredient per acre between petal fall and January 31st. I also wanna note that active ingredient is identified as AI in the table. And we'll also be referring to this as AI throughout the presentation. Foliar applications for all four chemicals would have a maximum application rate of 0.172 pounds active ingredient per acre after petal fall with the second application no later than December 1st. I would also like to note that for the most part, the maximum application rates proposed by DPR are within the application rates found on currently registered product labels. However, one of the exceptions is the maximum soil application rate for metacloprid. The proposed rate of 0 0.086 pounds AI per acre is less than the rate on currently registered product labels. Another option to consider would be to instead prohibit soil applications to citrus crops. The growing season for citrus is defined as one year. Please note that some citrus are indeterminate bloomers, and as a result, the proposed regulations would essentially prohibit use of the four neonicotinoids on any indeterminate blooming crops. For the palm fruit crop group, which includes crops such as pears and apples, the proposed crop specific regulation would limit soil applications of any of the four neonicotinoids from post bloom to harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.38 pounds AI per acre. The limit for the soil applications of the four neonicotinoids would be from post bloom to harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.2 pounds AI per acre. Please note that DPR is proposing an exception to one of the general application restrictions for palm fruit. In the case of palm fruit, both soil and foliar applications can be made during the season up to a total maximum of 0.5 pounds AI per acre, with foliar applications not to exceed 0.12 pounds AI per acre. DPR is proposing the exception because we had data indicating that the combination applications with the specific limitations do not present a risk to bees. The growing season for palm fruit is defined as one year. For the stone fruit crop group, which includes crops such as peaches, cherries, and apricots, the proposed crop specific regulation would limit soil applications of all four active ingredients from post bloom to harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.38 pounds AI per acre. Note that maximum foliar application rates vary with each chemical, so I'd like to give an example of a metacloprid. The limit for foliar applications of a metacloprid would be the period from post bloom to harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.5 pounds AI per acre. 
Like palm fruit, DPR is proposing an exception to one of the general application restrictions for stone fruit. A combination of soil and foliar applications would be allowed up to a total maximum of 0.5 pounds active ingredient per acre, with foliar applications not to exceed 0.12 pounds AI per acre. The reason for this exception is that there was residue data for these combination applications that were found to be acceptable. Please note that DPR is proposing to prohibit soil applications of clothianidin and imidacloprid on peaches. The growing season for stone fruit is defined as one year. Almonds are covered in the proposed regulations under the tree nut crop group. However, they are a bit different than the rest of the tree nut crop group as they are highly attractive to bees. The rest of the tree nut crop group are moderately attractive to bees and Brittany will cover them in the next section. The proposed crop specific regulations would prohibit soil applications in almonds while the foliar applications are limited to a maximum of 0.2 pounds AI per acre between post bloom and harvest for all four active ingredients. The growing season for almonds is defined as one year. Now we'll stop and ask for questions and comments regarding the proposed mitigation measures for crop groups that are highly attractive to bees that I just spoke on. Those are citrus fruit, stone fruit, home fruit, and almonds. If you have any written questions and you're watching in Zoom, please use the Q&A box and not the chat function. Also, if you have questions not related to those crops, we ask that you hold them until another commenting period. As before, when asking a question or providing a comment, please state your name and any organization you are with. Again, with we have 15 minutes for questions or comments and oral questions with limited to two minutes. At the end of 15 minutes, we'll wrap up with the questions we are on and then we will uh, ask that you hold any remaining until the end of the presentation or submit them by email. Okay, we have a verbal question posed with a hand raise. So I'm going to go ahead and promote Jim Cranery and allow you to talk. Jim, go ahead and speak and unmute yourself when you're able. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to make some comments on the mitigation proposal. Uh, my name is Jim Cranny um, with the California Citrus Quality Council. And we represent citrus growers and packers, along with our colleagues from the California Citrus Mutual and the Citrus Research Board. Uh, the California citrus industry is mindful of the need to protect honeybees, and we support efforts to enhance bee protection. Our industry already makes significant contributions to bee protection through compliance activities that minimize the use of pesticides during bloom and through cooperation with beekeepers. However, bee protection is only one of several important industry priorities. The industry must also protect the crop from a host of insect threats and diseases. The citrus industry accomplishes this through the use of integrated pest management programs that rely on a combination of pesticides and non-pesticide control strategies. Unfortunately, DPR's neonicotinoid mitigation proposal will remove important tools that the industry needs and make it more difficult to implement IPM programs. We also have a number of questions about the mitigation proposal since the mitigations seem to be out of proportion to the risk determination. Additionally, the emergency provision has a number of flaws that would make it very difficult to implement. Despite these reservations, we look forward to further dialogue with DPR so we can accomplish the dual objectives of pollinator protection and sustainable pest management for citrus growers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for your comment. And we look forward to continuing conversations with you as well. And I'm glad to see that you made it onto this webinar where we're able to get your comments. Thank you.
Okay, moving into our question and answer box, we have a statement from Matt Barr, who writes, the rates cited seem to come from Appendix 3, California registered agricultural uses of imidacloprid, dimethoxam, clothianidin, and dinotefiron on pages 35 through 57 from the California neonicotinoid risk determination. Is this correct? Hi, Matt. Thank you for your comment. Um, I actually do not have the California neonicotinoid risk determination in front of me, but um, I'd be more than happy to check that after this webinar, and then we'll follow up with you and let you know if that is correct. So I will maybe add a little bit to that. I can't speak to those exact page numbers, but I do want to reiterate that we have done some additional scientific evaluation since that risk determination came out. So in cases where the rates that are listed here do not match what's in that document, it's based on the review of additional studies that were performed at lower than maximum application rates. So there are places where there are differences from that risk determination document and what you're seeing here. Um, but yeah, happy to follow up with you in more detail in the future. Okay, we have another question posed in the Q&A box. Jonah Owens writes, what alternative approaches to neonicotinoids are being proposed? Are you looking at non-chemical alternatives to pesticides? For example, using biological controls like beneficial insects, like ladybugs, minute pirate bugs, hoverflies, and lace wings to control aphids. Hi, hey, Jonah. That's a good question. Um, at this point, we're pretty early on into our mitigation efforts. And so our focus right now is um, going through the rulemaking process for neonicotinoids uh, in agricultural areas. Um, but that's something to be mindful of as we move forward about alternates. Thank you, Russell. So at this time, we don't have any hands raised for verbal questions, and it does look like we don't have any Q&A at this point. Shelley, are there any email questions that we have currently pending? No email uh, questions since the last segment. Okay, so in order to ensure that we just continue through the presentation in an efficient manner. Oh, looks like we do have a question and answer post. I apologize. Judith Pena writes, Judith of Clean Earth for Kids, a youth board artist. Being part of the youth, I care about our future. Why are human health impacts of neonicotinoids not listed? things like reproductive toxicity and their impact on groundwater. Is it possible to list the side effects of neonics to human health on a slide or a link or something? Hi, Judith, that's a great question. Thank you for commenting in. So the scope of our reevaluation is based on pollinator concerns and agricultural crops. But as Karen Morrison mentioned earlier, um, our department is doing a comprehensive risk assessment, human health risk assessment, um, outside of this reevaluation. And so there's many different branches at DPR that are also reviewing neonicotinoid use. Um, our focus is just on the pollinators at this moment for this reevaluation. Good question, thank you. Okay, again, don't see any Q&A or verbal questions at this time. Shelly, do you have any email questions? Yes, we have a new email question. We have another question from Justin Golding, PCA. He, uh, he comments and asks, the proposed maximum application rate of metacloprid is proposed at 0 0.086 pounds AI. How did you determine this to be a viable rate to control insects as a soil applied application? Did you look at Dr. Frank Burns' work at UC Riverside on neonic and residues in citrus. So thank you for your question, Justin. Um, we, so there's a number of ways that, it, well, I guess to back up, the way that we determine rates is through residue data and um, also through bridging strategy. And so additional information will become available on our scientific evaluations. Um, 
posted with those economic analyses that I mentioned earlier um, in the coming weeks. And so uh, that should be listed in there as well for your review. Thank you, Russell. So we do have seven minutes remaining of question and answer. Again, I don't see any verbal questions or hands raised at this point. And it does look like our question and answer box is clear. Shelly, can you confirm that the email questions are clear at this time? No new email questions. Perfect. So let's go ahead and continue on with the presentation if there are no further questions. All right. Oh, I apologize. Looks like there are a few more questions to be answered. Let's go ahead and start with a question and answer posed by Jonah Owens. Who were the early engagement stakeholders for the proposed regulations? How does a group become an early stakeholder? Did you reach out to groups like Beyond Pesticides and Pesticide Action Network? Thank you, Jenna, for your question. Uh, we have been engaging with multiple stakeholders um, from nonprofit groups to um, registrants, commodity organizations. Um, so we've done quite a bit of extensive work in trying to understand the cultivation practices and uses of neonicotinoids out in the field. And um, so we've had various conversations with a pretty broad spectrum of folks. Thank you, Russell. Moving into some verbal comments, we have Ed Ishida with his hand raised. Ed, go ahead and unmute yourself when you're able and go ahead and make your comment. Ed, are you having technical difficulties? Ed? Hello, Ed, can you hear us? It doesn't seem like we can hear you yet. Ed, if you're by chance calling in by phone, can you try star 69 to see if that'll allow you to unmute yourself? Okay, Ed, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and pose your question via the Q&A box. It does seem like we're experiencing some technical difficulties and can't hear you. Moving into our next verbal question, I have Jonah Owens. Jonah, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak when you're able. Sorry, Jonah, that was my fault. Go ahead and unmute yourself again. Am I on? Yes, you are, I apologize. Okay, I, um, in response to my question earlier, I wanted to, I guess, like delve a little deeper and like which um, groups have you talked to specifically in organic and regenerative agriculture? Like I'm just trying to, uh, is there, were there outcomes to those talks? Are there notes just so we can learn about what you know what went on in that discussion i guess yeah thank you for that question jonah and i've seen we all talk. we have a similar question for that in the q a us on this um and so there's been a number of folks both um from a number of different ngos that we've had specific conversations about this with as well as um some broader groups that have a strong historic interest in pesticides um, as well as industry and registrant groups. Part of, and you're certainly happy to talk about a list of who that is. I'm, I'm hesitant to, to list out the names in this meeting because it is a joint set of discussions and I don't know that it's necessarily helpful to run through every single list of who we've met with at this stage because they are pre-regulatory discussions. Um, the 
range of materials is really, a lot of it is for us to listen to and try to understand and hear people's concerns and questions about what the implications are for the actions that we take, what the concerns are that are being raised, how we can best think about addressing those and moving forward. Um, this echoes actually a lot of the questions that have been raised on this workshop around impacts to groundwater, impacts to native pollinators, impacts to industry, and it's really a, a wide range. Um, you know, certainly happy that if you have additional questions, more than happy to meet with you individually, um, but we don't typically post a list of everyone that we consult with prior to regulatory action um, in order to help have as full and open discussions as we can to get the best feedback that we can in order to move forward. Thank you, Karen. We do have a comment posed by Victoria Hornbaker in the Q&A. Victoria writes, building on Justin's question about the proposed soil application rate for imidacloprid on citrus, if efficacy has not been determined at the proposed rate, are concerns about potential are there concerns about potential to develop resistance? Hi, Victoria, thank you for your question. So efficacy is always a concern. Um, so that's something we definitely need to dive into a little deeper to make sure that it is efficacious um, as we move forward. Um, we wouldn't wanna um, encourage the use if it's not efficacious. Perfect, thank you, Russell. So at this time, we only have 30 seconds left in the Q&A, so I'm going to recommend we just move on. If there are any further questions on this, please do feel free to pose them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Next, we will go through the proposed mitigation for crop groups that for the most part are moderately attractive to bees, which includes crops such as berries, cereal grains, cucurbits, and fruiting vegetables. The general application restrictions would apply to all of these crops. The additional application rate and timing mitigation are proposed to apply only if managed pollinators will be used to pollinate crops within the crop groups. If managed pollinators will not be used, then only the general, the general restrictions apply. To help clarify this, here's a flowchart for the crops that are moderately attractive to bees. At the top, we have the question, does the crop use managed pollinators? If the answer is yes, then both the general application restriction in YYYY.1 and the crop specific restrictions apply. If the answer is no, then only the general application restrictions in section YYYY.1 apply. For example, strawberry is a crop that does not use managed pollinators. Therefore, only the general application restrictions in section YYY1 apply. And the crop specific restrictions under berries YYYY.2 do not apply. The berries crop groups include crops such as strawberries, grapes, and blueberries. The general application restrictions apply to this crop group. But if managed pollinators will be used, then all applications to crops in this crop group are prohibited, with a couple exceptions for mulberries and grapes. Mulberries are not subject to the regulations because they are different from other berry crops in that they have been identified as not attractive to bees. DPR is proposing separate mitigation for grapes that I will go over next. The growing season for these types of crops is defined as one year. For grapes, the general application restrictions apply. And if, knowledge, if managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then soil applications of clothianidin, dinotephron, and thymothoxin 
will only be allowed until bud burst with a maximum application rate of 0.2 pounds active ingredient per acre. Foliar applications of all four neonicotinoids would be limited to the period between post bloom and harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.1 pounds active ingredient per acre. In addition, DPR is proposing to prohibit soil applications of emitted clopid to grapes. I also want to highlight that the proposed maximum application rate for dinotephron soil applications are lower than the lowest application rate on any currently registered pesticide product. Another option is to, consi to consider is prohibit soil applications of dinotephron to grapes. The growing season for grapes is one year. The cereal grain crop groups include crops such as barley, corn, oats, rice, and wheat. Some of the crops in this group are moderately attractive to bees and some have been identified as not attractive to bees. The general application restrictions apply to all crops except for barley, oats, rice, rye, triticale, and wheat. These exempted crops are not subject to the provisions of the regulations as they are the ones identified as not being attractive to bees. For other cereal green crops, such as corn, if managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then additional application restrictions will apply. Soil applications of any of the four neonicotinoids would be limited to at seed planting with a maximum application rate of 0.18 pounds of active ingredient per acre. Foliar applications would be limited to the period from planting until heading, also known as inflorescence or tassel emergence, with a maximum application rate of 0.126 pounds of active ingredient per acre. The growing season for cereal grains is from planting until harvest. If managed pollinators will not be used on these crop, on these other cereal green crops, only the general restrictions apply. The cucurbit vegetables crop group includes crops such as cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, and zucchinis. The general application restrictions apply to all cucurbit crops. If managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then additional restrictions will apply. The proposed rate and timings vary for each active ingredient. So I would just like to discuss thymethoxin restrictions as an example. Soil applications with thymethoxin would be limited to the period from planting until the fifth true leaf on the main stem unfolds with a maximum rate of 0.172 pounds of active ingredient per acre. Foliar applications with thymethoxin would be limited to the period from planting until bloom with a maximum application rate of 0.172 pounds per acre. I also wanna point out that the proposed maximum application rate for imidacloprid is less than the rate on currently registered product labels. Another alternative would be to prohibit soil applications of imidacloprid on cucurbits. The growing season for cucurbits is from planting until harvest. There is an exemption to one cucurbit crop for which this table does not, does not apply to, which is cucumbers. The exception to the cucurbit vegetable crop groups are for cucumbers. For cucumbers, if managed pollinators will be used, then foliar applications of dinotephiron, imidacloprid, and thymethoxin are prohibited. The fruiting vegetables crop group includes crops such as peppers, tomatoes, and eggplant. The general application restrictions apply to all fruiting vegetables. If managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then additional restrictions will apply. For soil applications, DPR is proposing to prohibit use of imidacloprid. For the other three active ingredients, applications would be limited to the period from planting until the third leaf on the main stem 
main shoot unfolds. With a maximum application rate of 0.172 pounds active ingredient per acre, with exceptions for certain crops. Foliar applications would be prohibited across all four active ingredients. The growing season for fruiting vegetables is from planting until harvest. The exceptions for fruiting vegetable crops are for peppers, goji berry, ground cherry, martina, okra, roselle, and tomatillo. If managed pollinators will be used in these crops, DPR is proposing to prohibit soil applications of all four neonicotinoids. As I mentioned in the previous slide, slide, foliar applications are already prohibited for these crops. The oil seed crop group includes crops such as cotton and sunflower. The general application restrictions apply to all oil seed crops. If managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, both soil and foliar applications of clothianidin, dinotefron, and thymethoxam will be prohibited. With regards to imidacloprid, DPR is proposing to prohibit soil applications and limit foliar applications to the period from planting until main stem elongation, with a maximum application rate of 0.25 pounds per acre. The growing season for oil seeds crops is from planting until harvest. The root and tuber vegetable crop group includes crops such as potatoes, carrots, and radishes. The general application restrictions apply to all root and tuber vegetables. If managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then additional restrictions will apply. Soil applications of imidacloprid would be prohibited. Soil applications of the other three active ingredients would be limited to one application at seeding or tuber planting, with a maximum application rate of 0.2 pounds of active ingredient per acre per season. Bullier applications would be limited to the period from planting to the beginning of main stem elongation or crop cover with a maximum rate of 0.05 pounds active ingredient per acre per season. I also want to point out that the proposed maximum application rate for dinotefron of 0.2 pounds active ingredient per acre is less than the rate on currently registered product labels. An option is prohibiting foliar applications of dinotefron. The growing season for root and tuber vegetables is planting until harvest. The exceptions for root and tuber crops are cassava. Cassava is not subject to the proposed regulation as this crop has been identified as not attractive to bees. If harvested before bloom, drill some artichokes or sunchokes, carrots, sugary root, sugar beets, turnip, turnip rooted chervil, turnip rooted parsley, parsnip, radish, rutabaga, and skirt are not subject to the proposed regulations. The tree nut crop group includes crops such as almonds, walnuts, and pistachios. The general application restriction applied to all tree nut crops except pistachio, beechnut, ginkgos, and pecans. Applications to pistachio, beechnut, ginkgos, and pecan crops are not subject to the provisions of the regulation as they have been identified as not being attractive to bees. For other tree nut crops, such as walnuts, Brazil nuts, and macadamia, if managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then all soil applications are prohibited. Foliar applications are limited to the period from post bloom to harvest with a maximum application rate of 0.2 pounds active ingredient per acre per season. If managed pollinators will not be used on these other tree nut crops, only the general, the general restrictions apply. But for almonds, as Russell previously discussed, 
Since they are highly attractive to bees, the proposed application rates and timings in the table are required regardless of whether managed pollinators are used. The growing season for tree nut crop groups is defined as one year. Lastly, are a few other moderately attractive crops and crop groups, including legume vegetables, such as chickpeas and lentils, tropical and subtropical crops, such as avocados and bananas, and the individual crops, coffee and peanuts. The general application restrictions apply to all of these crops and crop groups. If managed pollinators will be used during the growing season, then all applications of neonicotinoids would be prohibited. I will stop at this point and ask for questions and comments regarding the mitigation measures for crop groups that are moderately attractive to bees. As before, when you speak, please state your name and organization with your, you are with. If you have a written question you're, and you are watching in Zoom, please use the Q&A box and not the chat function. Again, we have 15 minutes for questions or comments and oral questions. And oral questions will be limited to two minutes. Any remaining questions can be asked at the end or submitted by email question. All right, first off, we have two comments or questions posed in the Q&A box. We'll start with Amelie who writes, what is the state of California doing to move towards truly sustainable farming methods like regenerative farming that minimize pesticide use, encourage the natural enemies of crop pests and support biodiversity and healthy soils? So thank you for the question. This is a huge focus of the department um, and is actually one of the twin pillars of our mission to really look at um, reduced risk pest management and thinking about how do we use um, how do we use the softest techniques possible to be able to manage pests? So while chem chemicals are one tool in that, there's a lot of other practices like those that you mentioned around regenerative farming, biopesticides, um, uh, predatory insects and others that are also very effective at managing um, pests in farming. And so we have, um, we work in partnership with a lot of other state agencies as well as um, NGOs and industry groups to think about moving the ball forward on this. This is a, California is a massive farming state. And so there's a lot of discussions and um, really culture changes that need to happen in order to think about how do you um, both feed the state, the country and the world as well as manage pests in the lowest risk way possible. So a couple of specific things that we've done on this, I'll just say this very briefly and then we can, um, but have, there's a lot of information on our website about this. Um, we've done quite a bit of work. We just finished a contract looking at alternative pest management, um, specifically around moving away from um, the organophosphate chlorpyrifos. And we're currently in the process of launching a new work group that's looking at sustainable pest management very broadly throughout the state. Um, we're currently working on um, finalizing the scope for that, but it will touch on all of the elements that you've identified here. There's other partnerships that are currently going ongoing, such as the Healthy Soils Coalition that are looking at, again, a broad range of farming practices around soil health, of which pests and pest management are one component of that. So we're really proud of, of um, the partnerships that we've been able to, um, to undertake as a part of this and really hope to be able to use that to move the ball forward. Thank you so much, Karen. We have another question posed by Jay, who writes, do you have persons we can contact with regards to toxic pesticides impacts on pollinators and people located close to crop areas? Yeah, thank you for your question, Jay. You can um, feel free to contact us in our neonics email, uh, also our voicemail that we have open to. We, We'll take any questions or comments surrounding neonics and pollinators and anything outside of that scope too. And if that needs to be forwarded to someone else at DPR, we can always do that and get you in contact with them. Thank you, Brittany. 
At this time, there are no open question and answers posed in the Q&A box, and it doesn't look like we have any hands raised for verbal comments. Shelley, do we have any questions posed by email at this time? Thank you, Brenna. Yes, we have one question right now. Uh, this is posed by Timothy Joseph of Landis International Inc. And he asks, there are, num are, there are a number of instances of mitigations for pesticides on crops on which they are not registered. Why is this? Yeah, thank you for your question, Timothy. We, as we've walked through these slides, um, every table that we've kind of shown for each crop group has rates and tamings for every active ingredient. And so because these are grouped by crop groups, that rate or that use might be registered for one of the crops in the crop group. Additionally, it, we had lots of discussions about if a rate isn't registered or if a use isn't registered, do we put it in our regulations as not registered? We ultimately decided to document any work that we have done in determining rates and timings. That way, if in the future, a pesticide product comes in and is proposing to add that use, then we would not need to continuously update the regulations. Thank you for your comment and question. Thank you, Brittany. There are no further email questions at the moment. Perfect. Thank you, Shelley. So at this time, we don't have any questions and answers posed either in the written Q&A boxes or in our verbal comments by hand raising. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and continue on with the presentation. We will now move on to crops that are not attractive to bees or are harvested before bloom. DPR has determined that for crops and crop groups that are not attractive to bees or are harvested before bloom, labeled applications do not present risks to pollinators, so no additional mitigation for these crops is needed. The crops that are included in this group include bulb vegetables, such as onion, garlic, herbs and spices such as basil, cilantro, rosemary, leafy vegetables including brassica coal crops such as celery, head and leaf lettuce, Brussels sprouts, mustard greens, and miscellaneous crops including globe artichoke, hops, mint, and tobacco. In cases when pollinators are used in these crops, or when the crop is grown for seed, then applications of all four neonics are prohibited. I will stop at this point and ask for questions regarding the mitigation measures for crop groups that are not attractive to bees or harvested before bloom. We have five minutes for questions or comments and oral questions will be limited to one minute during this session. If you have a written question and you're watching in Zoom, please use the Q&A box and not the chat function. Once we reach five minutes, we will wrap up with the question that we are on and remaining questions may be asked at the end of the presentation or submitted by email. All right, so starting off, I don't see any hands raised for verbal comments, and I do not see any questions posed by question and answer. So Shelly, can you confirm if you've received anything by email at this point? No new questions by email. Perfect. Thank you, Shelly. I do see an anonymous attendee has posed a question in the Q&A box. This attendee writes, Pesticides are a radical social, health, environmental, and climate issue. What about the children, families, farm workers, et cetera, that have no choice but to be exposed at home, school, or work? Why are their health not being addressed in these regulations? 
Thank you for your comment. I did want to point out that neonicotinoids are critical tools used by our growers to combat exotic pests such as Asian citrus psyllid that causes citrus screening and glassy ring sharpshooter. And it's a balance between what we're working on, which is the scope of our re-evaluation and that's for pollinators. Thank you for your comment. Shelly, do you have any comments or questions posed by email at this moment? Yes, we have a new email that has come in. Robin Clark of UPL asks, if these mitigation measures are passed, how are the label amendments going to be managed? The labels will have to be federally amended and then submitted to CDPR. What kind of timing will registrants have to make changes? And how will the influx of labels be managed by CDPR? Thank you for your comment, Robin. The mitigation that we're proposing is just that they're regulations and they will not be placed on pesticide labels. That's managed through US EPA. But once US EPA makes their interim decision final, then any label changes are dictated through US EPA and we will work on those as expeditiously as possible. Thank you, Denise, for that answer. Okay, again, we have no pending questions in the Q&A boxes, and we do not have any attendees with their hands raised. Shelly, can you confirm that there are no email questions at this time? No further email questions. Thank you, Shelly. So let's go ahead and continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Denise. To reiterate the information we covered, DPR is proposing a multi-level approach to mitigating neonicotinoid pollinator concerns in agriculture. The first level consists of crops that are highly attractive to bees that would be subject to general restrictions and crop-specific restrictions, regardless of whether managed pollinators are used. The second level consists of crops that are relatively less attractive to pollinators. Proposed mitigation is split into two sections here. One, the general use restrictions such as do not apply during bloom applies to all, all the crops. And second, if managed pollinators are used, then additional crop specific mitigations will apply as well. The third level consists of crops that are not attracted to pollinators or the crop is harvested before bloom. EPR is proposing no mitigation measures for these crops as there is no exposure potential to bees. It's important to remember that we do already have pollinator restrictions in place as we assess the feedback from today's webinar and incorporate that feedback into our proposed regulations. As a reminder, comments will be accepted through October 11th, 2020. Again, please note that the original closing date of the commenting period was September 11th, but we have since granted a request to extend the comment period by 30 days to allow more time to review and comment on the draft regulations. DPR plans to post several additional documents this coming week that may be helpful in developing comments and feedback, including two different economic analysis that the California Department of Food and Agriculture CDFA conducted and other documents clarifying scientific evaluation. Look out for a California notice announcing the posting of these additional documents and the extension of the commenting period. Our next steps in the neonic reevaluation are to review the feedback from these webinars and incorporate them into the mitigation proposal where possible. Additionally, DPR will continue to coordinate with CDFA to receive an economic analysis for any revisions made to the proposal as well as meet with stakeholders and the public as a part of the final mitigation development. We anticipate to formally notice the rulemaking proposal and post the draft regulations on DPR's website late in the 2020 calendar year, but depending on how extensive the feedback is, it may be early 2021. This process will include a formal rulemaking hearing along with a public comment period. 
If you have not done so already, please sign up for, the, for DPR's email subscription for notices of proposed regulatory action by clicking on the link embedded in the slide so that you receive information from our department once these items have been posted. At this point, we would like to have an open question and comment session for the remainder of the webinar. We will conclude this webinar promptly at 8 p.m. If you have a written question and you're watching in Zoom, please use the Q&A box and not the chat function. Please remember to include your name and organization or group that you're with when stating or emailing your questions and uh, comments. You can email comments and questions to neonix at cdpr.ca.gov. Thank you, Russell. So we do have a question posed in the Q&A by John who writes, who makes the final decision on these proposed regulations? So um, as we go through this rulemaking process and we're gonna incorporate all the feedback that we receive from all stakeholders. So the public, um, nonprofits, county ag commissioners, registrants, and um, it has to go through a level of review. So it will go through um, our management executive um, agency. So there's gonna be quite a bit of review that goes into these regulations. Perfect, thank you, Russell. And John has also followed up with an additional Q&A question. He writes, when will the next stakeholder meeting be held? That, that's a good question. Um, you know, it really depends on how many comments we receive and how long it takes us to address those comments. And once we go through the rulemaking process, there will be more outreach opportunities where we'll hear your, your feedback. Thank you for your questions, John. Okay, so there is nothing posed in the Q&A box at this moment, and I do not see any attendees with their hands raised. Shelly, have you received any questions by email at this time? No new email questions. Perfect, thank you, Shelly. I do see we have since received a Q&A from Sarah. Sarah of Exercise writes, can you provide an estimated time frame for the human health risk assessment that is currently underway? Hi, Sarah, that's a great question. Um, since we're in the reevaluation group, we aren't working on the human health risk assessment. Um, but if you submit your, well, we can always follow up with you and give you more of a timetable once we research the question for you a little bit. I can answer that for you, Sarah. Um, sorry for not clicking in quick enough. Um, so we're currently working through that document. Um, we are hoping to have a completed draft toward the end of this year or early next year. That will then go for a number of rounds of peer review, both um, with, with agency peers. So all of our risk assessments are reviewed by both OEHA and US EPA. Um, it will also be available for, um, for external review at that point as well. When that is complete, we will have a notice of it up on our website and you're, feel free to follow up with me for additional information. Thank you, Karen. Okay, again, nothing in the Q&A box, nothing in the verbal comments. Oh, Sarah writes, thanks, Karen and Russell. I appreciate it. All right, and so Shelly, can you confirm if we have any pending questions in the email at this point? No new email questions. Okay. That we have no pending questions at this time. So we can go ahead and maybe conclude this presentation if there's no further questions. It looks like there's a hand raised. Oh, thank you, Brittany. So Suzanne, I'm going to go ahead and promote you and allow you to talk. Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak when you are able. Hi, I just like to say thank you so much. I called in last night um, and I do have a quick question, but um, I called in last night to tell you about what happened to me um, with my pesticide exposure being poisoned on San Diego County lands, um, lease lands. 
and how neonicotinoids, because you guys know this, they are also neurotoxins and hurt, um, hurt us. So we're very interested. So I'm, hi, sorry, you guys already know. I'm Suzanne Hume. Um, I started cleanearthforkids.org because of my pesticide exposure and I had previously been a teacher. So um, so my question is, um, I've been listening and thank you to everyone that's called into this. It just means so much. You guys are working on this for the future for our kids and um, the bees trying to, to do all of this and your hard work. But so um, my question is, I know people had asked about um, like uh, questions like um, uh, more um, information about, uh, we would love to know who the, who the other people are, the stakeholders that are working on alternatives um, to chemical synthetic pesticides. And thank you to the Xerxes Foundation. And I heard NRDC on here last night too. And I know that there are others. But um, so I would love to see that. And thank you for other people that ask these questions. Um, so if you've got stuff on your website or something so we can see the process. So my question is, as you're moving through this process and you're talking to different stakeholders and you're making these decisions, how do we in the public stay informed as to not only when the stakeholder meetings are being held, but, and I'm sure you'll be transparent and that will be on your website, but also, um, the process of um, looking at the specific pesticides, neonicotinoids, granted there are only four, and we had talked before about many organophosphates also hurt bees, kill the bees. So how will we know how that process is going? So will there be like a blog? Will there be um, meeting notifications? So what is the process of transparency um, that you can offer? Um, this would be of great relief to me as I have personally, uh, my life has been turned upside down um, with this. So um, if you could please be very specific in your answer about transparency um, and when we're able to meet um, or just you know, ha have information available online about here are the meetings, here are the notes, um, these are the concerns um, and all of that. So that would just really be helpful. And the last question I have is um, Senator Tom Udell from um, a Senator in New Mexico um, came forward uh, with this fantastic bill um, that would actually um, prohibit no neonicotinoid use along with organophosphate use um, and paraquat because one sip is, is toxic. So I'm just curious as to the state of California, um, and since you are the Department of Pesticide Regulations, um, what are you working with um, Senator Udall's office? And if you are um, looking for doing those things and engaged in that, could you let me know or let us know? And then also, well, I have so many other questions, but I don't want to take all of the time um, if there are other people. And I'd love to hear uh, your response about that. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'll take the first question um, about how to stay informed while we're going through this process. Um, we have a number of electronic mailing lists that you can subscribe to. Um, actually, if you go to our website, um, there is the proposed regulatory actions listserv or electronic mailing list that you'll want to subscribe to. Uh, but also we have our notices of stakeholders um, that'll keep you informed when things are going through the process. So um, if you go to our main webpage, at the very top there's a banner. It says like, home programs, databases. You go to um, programs, hover over that, you'll get a drop down menu. And then you'll get a, um, in that menu, there's the word registration. And underneath registration, there's a link there that says notices. Click on notices and then that'll bring you to the main notice page where you can subscribe to multiple email lists. And that's a good way to stay well informed as we go through these processes. And it's where we also announce these types of workshops. And then I'll just add on a couple of points and really I know it's um, appreciate you signing in for both yesterday's and today's today's workshops. Um, as we move forward with this, you know, you're we are absolutely committed to being transparent with our process and the information that we're looking at. So what we will do is after um, after the workshops and after the comment period has closed in mid-October, 
Um, we will likely post a summary of the comments that we've received. Um, it will likely not be a point by point listing of every single comment because I expect that we will receive quite a number over the next couple of months, but to um, fully summarize what we have heard. Um, and then that feedback, as Russell mentioned, will be incorporated into the formal rulemaking. So what we're doing right now is considered pre-regulatory work, and it's a more informal process of trying to understand and hear um, people's concerns and perspectives. Um, to your latter point about the federal legislation that's been proposed, we do track and look at federal legislation. We, um, we don't comment on federal legislation, but we are aware of that bill that's moving. Can I ask about the governor um, also? So um, so the governor had um, been very clear, had um, put out, um, had made a statement, sorry, I'm so nervous. Um, the governor had made a statement about um, buffer zones um, with pesticides. And that's really important because, um, you know, these neonicotinoids, when they travel, you know, harming um, other bees, whether it's managed bees or native bees, and then also people. So the governor of California had a very clear um, order on May 7th regard regarding pesticides um, near homes and schools during COVID-19. And um, so I was just wondering, we were talking about transparency and thank you so much for having this meeting. Um, it would, so just as a side note, it would be super helpful. I know you said the drop down menu and things, but it would be really helpful if um, things could be like on the front page. And so you click because, you know, the people that really, um, this really matters to a lot of us um, don't have, you know, <laughs> we don't have years of, of um, schooling in this. We just sort of learn about it after we are impacted. And so, um, and, you know, people are working and very busy and have time. So I uh, have limited time. So I'm curious as to, um, to that piece. And then also um, with um, California Department of Pesticide Regulation. So for example, when um, the city of Oceanside where I live, um, we were able to help pass an IPM um, and that's so great. But for example, um, Ags Weights and Measures of the County of San Diego didn't even know about this and it does apply to leased lands. So I really feel like there's a huge, um, there's just, there's not the information, transparency, things available on the website. So in addition to the drop down menu, um, and thank you so much, you guys are so nice um, for helping us and everything with this. This is um, so personal to me and um, thank you so much for your time. But so in addition to the drop down menu, um, what kinds of things can you offer on your website or are you willing to do um, so that the general public can know about this? So for example, um, you know, we found out about this meeting, but a lot of people, they don't know about this meeting and they don't know. So of course, because I know you had said you met with the people in advance, you know, from industry, they were there. Um, and the other, whatever their pesticide applicators, you know, they are aware and they're on this call and farmers, but people in the general population are not aware. So I really feel like this is a huge thing. Um, I've been going through this for years. And so um, trying to, not years, but a few years now. So I'm just curious again about what can happen with transparency. And then also, can you respond to what the governor's, um, the governor has said and give some overall guidance about what you guys are doing to make sure that San Diego County and other counties are, um, are following what they need to be doing to protect human health and also our bees. Thank you. Suzanne, thanks very much for that very thoughtful question and the comments that were uh, embedded therein. You know, we work very closely with the Ag Commissioners. So with regards to the San Diego County Ag Commissioner, I know that she's very involved in a lot of local IPM issues, and I would encourage you to work with her office to learn a little bit more about the things that she's doing in San Diego County. And if you've had some challenges there, you can certainly reach out to me. With regard to the governor's guidance that was issued in early May, we worked very closely with uh, the governor's office on that and his instinct was to be as health protective as possible. And so that's why he directed Cal EPA in early May to issue that guidance, which was in the early days of the pandemic when folks were uh, you know, bringing their kids home to homeschool them and, and schools were closing and there were lots of questions about how uh, active 
you know, we could be as an agency to work with ag commissioners and pesticide applicators and farmers and others to more carefully regulate the activities that they were engaging in. This has been an unprecedented health crisis, obviously the worst respiratory health crisis that we've seen in a century in the United States. And so he felt that we really needed to make sure that ag commissioners knew what their roles and responsibilities were and that DPR, you know, was clear about what its responsibilities were and how it would protect public health and environmental health around the state of California. So I would say to you and to the many other NGO representatives on this call and other citizens in California is to stay engaged with us in this process and in the other things that we're doing around public and environmental health. Our website is a font of valuable information, but there's an awful lot of content there. And sometimes it's hard to wade through all of that. So sign up for as many of the notifications as you can, those that you think are relevant to uh, you know, what you're doing in San Diego County and information that you're more specifically interested in. And we'll just continue to make sure that we're representing the work of the department and communicating with Californians in as clear and as concise and as comprehensive a way as we can. And if you don't feel like you're you know, really hearing about what we're doing in a timely enough way, you know, you can send me a note or send to neonix at cdpr.ca.gov uh, comments or insights that you have about what this process has been for you. What we were really trying to do here at the end of the day is making sure that as many Californians who represent all the various interests that California uh, has, and we're a state of 40 million people, a nation state, as the governor likes to say, but we've got a robust $50 billion dollar agricultural economy that we really want to support because it means tens of thousands of jobs to the state of California, but we also have lots of folks who are really concerned and, and worried about the impacts of pesticide applications in the communities where they live. And you've articulated a lot of those points very eloquently tonight. So just make sure that you stay involved in our process. I think you've seen from Brittany and Russell, Denise and Karen and others tonight, you know, people on the state side who want to engage with you, who want to engage with Californians writ large about the things that we're trying to do on Neonix, but more broadly, what we're trying to do as a department to shift the paradigm in many ways from a reliance on synthetic chemical pesticides to one that focuses more on safe and sustainable pest management techniques and tools and practices and protocols. And that involves a lot of different things. IPM includes chemical pesticides at the end of the day, but we also want to make sure that folks like you know that there are other options out there as well. So really appreciate you signing into tonight's webinar and yesterday's for that matter, and uh, look forward to continuing to engage with you. And if you want to, uh, you know, reach out to me offline, you can certainly do that as well. Uh, my email is val.dolcini at cdpr.ca.gov. I look forward to hearing from you and anybody else who wants to engage on these issues related to pesticide regulation. We have a hard job at DPR, as you uh, have heard over the last couple of hours. You know, we're really in the crosshairs on a lot of big, important political and, and scientific and regulatory issues, but I think we do our job really well at the end of the day. And you can see that uh, I've got a lot of colleagues at the department who are committed to good public policy outcomes and things that make sense for all Californians, whether you're an urban resident, or a farmer, or an academic, or a pest control applicator, or any number of other folks who are involved in these issues. So thanks again for your questions and your insights, and I, I appreciate your engagement tonight. We do have a, another question posed in the Q&A. Theodore writes, is DPR taking into account the alternative chemicals and the risk that some of these pose if neonics, sorry, neonicotinoids are further restricted. Our mute button there for a second. Sorry about that. Thank you, Theodore, for your question. Um, DPR is aware that if restrictions go to on neonicotinoids, that there will be a shift in chemical use. Um, and so we are actively um, looking into that. Okay, there are no verbal questions at this time and no Q and A's pending in the Q and A box. Shelley, do you have any pending questions by email at this point? 
No new email questions. Okay. It sounds like that's the end of any of the questions that are posed. So we'll go ahead and close up with our last slide. Great. Thank you so much, Brenna, for managing the Q&A for us and for everyone for participating in this. Um, we know it's a commitment out of your evening, out of um, other things that you may have going on to be able to sign in and, um, and listen and provide really thoughtful um, and helpful feedback for us. So we really appreciate um, all of you and um, would encourage you to continue to engage with us in this process as we move forward. Thank you, Karen. And just a reminder that um, our public commenting period is open until October 11th. So please submit your feedback to us at munix uh, at cdpr.ca.gov. You're also more than welcome to send that to us um, by a hard copy, or we even have a voicemail set up so you can leave vocal or uh, oral comments to us. And I want to take the time to thank everyone for participating today and being a part of this webinar. Thank you so much and have a great night.